All right, it's an uh, absolute thrill to have Ragia uh, visiting us. He is an incredibly old and great friend of mine. No, he's not incredibly old. <laughs> God, I can't <laughs> Possibly, but he's an ancient grizzled guy. <laughs> no, no, he's been an incredible friend of mine for a very, very, very long uh, time. And actually, I don't think he, he knows this, but uh, um, the very, very first paper in a physics physics paper I ever read in my life, an actual physics paper, was Gia's paper. Oh, really? uh, yeah, Lawrence, uh, my advisor, assigned me a, a paper on solving the double triple splitting problem. Um, uh, that Gia had written, and it's an incredible paper, and it, and it gave me the mistaken impression that all physics papers were rollicking, amazing, fantastic romps filled with creative, incredible ideas. The next paper I read uh, disabused me of that notion that they were not all Gia papers. But um, uh, anyway, and then we, we, we were collaborated and friends for many, many years after that, so it's really a thrill to have you here today. And um, uh, he's going to be telling us about uh, saturons and dark matter. Right. I would say it's a great pleasure. Thanks very much. Thanks for hospitality. Juan, Nina. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, I will try to share some uh, uh, ideas about uh, probably it's better to start from this blackboard, right? Okay. And I always confuse the order. I start with this and then, yeah, I guess. Yeah. It doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, so that blackboard up there, uh, it's a little funny. All right, okay, yeah, I'll, the, the top one makes a noise from you. Okay, all right. <laughs> okay, I'm going to discuss about saturons uh, and their implications for dark matter. Um, um, and uh, so I will uh, structure the talk in the following way. So let me first uh, describe a concept. Of saturons, was, do, I, do I mean on the saturon saturations, and then um, give you an example, and then discuss uh, interesting feature that they 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 have uh, that can have very interesting implications cosmologically, potentially interesting implications in particular for dark matter. So and in particular. Uh, why they are different from other macroscopic uh, dark matter, such as, for example, uh, black holes or normal solitons. So, uh, what is special about saturons? Okay, so we can say saturons versus this. Okay, so now. Um, let me explain the concept. So, uh, so originally, my, my motivation was to try to understand better uh, Bekenstein bound on entropy from the point of view of quantum field theory. Okay. So, uh, long ago, Bekenstein wrote a, a entropy bound, which says that if I have a macroscopic object, I mean, usually this applies to macroscopic objects. So, I'm, I'm going to talk about macroscopic objects, multi particle states. So usually the entropy has to be uh, uh, less or equal to the, the energy of an object. So if you have an object of certain uh, size R and uh, energy E, uh, so it's basically times R, okay? I mean, there are two pies floating around, but in my, in my discussion, uh, I, I, will, I will do all the factors of order one, like 16 pi squared will be one, and, Okay. So yeah, so the scaling will be important. Yeah, sorry, we started without you. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> you waited and waited. <laughs> 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 okay, so this is this, and so basically, my, the, the point was to, to try to understand if I think in terms of uh, quantum field theory, what goes wrong if I try to. Uh, but try to highlight this part. Okay. Yeah. By the way, you can, this is a completely informal. You can interrupt my questions anytime. Yeah. Is, isn't this the one that Cassini proved using? Yeah, I'm not going to put this around works. No problem. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to challenge it. But I guess I'm asking if that's the type of, if isn't that the type of QFT interpretation you would, you would want to? You will see. Okay. So the, the Juan of the very kind this morning explained me. Uh, yeah. This, this uh, <laughs> 
point of view, but yeah, it will say it will be so so good matter, you know. Yeah. Um, so this will be in the language of sort of more uh, QFT particle physics person that thinks in terms of degrees of freedom and their coupling. Okay. And um, and then it turns out that uh, so, so some interesting things uh, turn out. Okay. Uh, now um, so here's the basically the point. The point is that uh, let's assume that we have a QFT quantum field theory. All right. With uh, uh, certain interacting degrees of freedom, okay. So whatever we can call them, phi quantum field theory field of fields, okay. Certain number of species, whatever, and they have uh, characteristic coupling. Let me call it alpha, okay. So basically, an alpha will be uh, an interaction span between this between this let's say four files, or for instance. Okay, so so alpha measures this interaction span. Um, okay, so now and then um, the question is: uh, suppose in this theory I have a self-sustained object. Okay, so that object could be a soliton, uh, it could be other composite. I don't know. For example, this chair is a solution in Maxwell theory, presumably, or something. So you have an object to which you can assign certain well-defined, well-defined size. Now. So what does it mean? Well, define size. Of course, uh, normally in quantum theory, uh, objects are consist of particles, and we can think of them as wave packets and wave packets spread. And of course, I, I, I'm assuming that there is a the spread out time is sufficiently long so that I can I can think of a, a size of this object. Okay, so there's the well defined sense in assigning uh, size size to, to this object and. Uh, and the question is, what's the maximal entropy that this object can carry in in the language of uh, QFT, um, certain parameters of QFT, okay? And uh, so let me first write the answer. So it turns out that there is a, uh, the, the answer can be written uh, in uh, three, three equivalent forms on top of this, okay, right? And, uh, uh, so first, which is very interesting, the, the, the form is an area law form. So the, the, uh, the entropy is less or equal to an area of, a, of an object uh, measured in units of a certain Goldstone mode. And this Goldstone mode uh, is a Goldstone mode of um, spontaneously broken Poincare symmetry. Of course, here I'm in QFT in flat space. So for a moment, I'm distancing myself uh, from gravity. Okay. And uh, so there is a Goldstone mode of broken uh, Poincare uh, symmetry. Okay. So essentially, the, the, if you want to tell, you can turn it, uh, the argument around and you can say that the Dickenstein bound can be written like this. Okay. It's an area. Okay. Of in, uh, measured in units of uh, Poincare Goldstone. Okay. Now, another form of the bound uh, has to do with the coupling alpha, and uh, essentially says that the the, uh, the entropy is, cannot exceed the inverse of the coupling that holds the system together. Okay. Of course, it's always the weakest coupling that comes in the game, and that therefore this may have some interesting things. With the weak gravity, when we discuss gravity after this, here we are not discussing gravity for the time being. Um, and finally, uh, if um, if uh, we have well defined composition of the object, for example, if I can think of soliton as some kind of coherent state uh, of uh, n quanta that carry the, uh, the the energy, so each carries energy. Uh, Approximate. So the typical wavelengths of quanta are given by the size of the object. And so in that case, the entropy is less than the occupation number okay, of quanta in the, in the system. Okay, so the, the quanta that contribute uh, into the main, the main contributors into the energy of the system. Okay, so this. Now, as you can see, this essentially reproduces Bekenstein uh, bound. Once we translate these parameters, in uh, terms of uh, energy or the, the, the reduce of the, of the object. Okay. It is important that alpha is dimensionless or 
alpha is dimensionless, yes. So alpha is a dimensionless quantum coupling. That's the way I define it, yes. Which of course we, we, we can always define. And of course also alpha runs. And so, the, yeah, good. Um, yeah, when I mean what, when I say alpha, I evaluate alpha for the, for the momentum transfer one over R. Okay, so that's the, it's a running coupling. Okay. Okay, so now let me do the following. Instead of going into generalities, let me give you an example. A simple example which illustrates the, the, the point, okay? Well, simple, not simple, whatever, but illustrates the point. So, example. Uh, so, example is barrio in SUN QCD, okay? So, barrio in SUN QCD with N colors and NF planes. Okay, so we have an F flavor, so quarks. Um, F flavor means like left right pair. I'll write this left right. Of course, we can also work in left left basis. That's right. And correspondingly, there's a flavor group. Okay, so U and F left times U and F right. Okay, so QCD with um, N colors and N F flavors. And coupling constant alpha. All right. Okay. So now for the end, I'm, I'm requiring that the theory is asymptotically free. So the, the, the number of flavors is not too high in order not to ruin, ruin the asymptotic freedom. Okay. So now um, we can form a top coupling, a collective coupling. Okay. Uh, top coupling. Uh, lambda. It's, it's alpha times n, we define this alpha times n. And then uh, I'm gonna take the limit, okay, uh, top limit, in, uh, so for which the, the theory simplifies, uh, substantially as you know. Uh, the limit is when n goes to infinity, alpha goes to zero, uh, that lambda is fixed, finite. And uh, also, NF over NC is also fine. Okay, I'm gonna take this limit. And start the in this limit. Now, I think people usually call this an Exactly, exactly. So that's, yeah, that's right. the only transparency version inside transcend. <laughs> be keeping an F fixed. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, I mean, toast coupling, this is color toast coupling. So mm -hmm. then we can define another one, which is Veneziano. Mm -hmm. Veneziano toast coupling for flavor. Uh, absolutely correct. Yeah. Yeah. Let me. Oh, this. It requires some, you know, some defining. <laughs> so, so, yeah. Now, in this, okay, this theory, I will only use the facts that are well known. I'm not going to. Try to invent the fact, but just to try to interpret those facts from the point of view of against of entropy in general. Okay, and um, so the uh, so in this theory we know what happens. What happens is that top coupling runs and becomes order one. It becomes critical, which is one. Let me call it one. Uh, um, critical at the scale lambda, and that's the QCD scale. And um, a theory uh, combines at that scale. Uh, and there is also chiral symmetry breaking. Okay? Uh, chiral symmetry breaking because of quark condensate. Um, and uh, uh, so the chiral symmetry, so there's this confinement and chiral symmetry breaking. Uh, so you went. And F L U and F I this is broken down to U1, uh, sorry, U U and F. Okay, spontaneously so broken down to this. And there are um, as a as a result of this breaking, there are F square minus one uh, and F square minus one goldstone bosons, ions, okay. Uh, one is eta prime and gets mass by 
So we tell them that it's uh, it's usually for one of uh, it gets mass with not usually it gets mass one over okay. So there is also eta prime. So in other words, there are over many two pions. And the um, pions decay constant f pi is uh, square root of uh, n times lambda and correspondingly pion coupling dimension four pion coupling is one over n one over lambda square okay so pions uh, go from bottoms now in this theory we have baryons okay and um, so baryons are composites of um, quarks so they are composites of n quarks and um, this is a, that's a beautiful picture uh, developed by Witten uh, in uh, about the description of baryon, and in particular, what the, the, the thing is the following. So you can have two uh, descriptions, right? So there's a description, short distance description in terms of quarks and gluons, right? And large distance description in terms of pions. And from the short distance perspective, of course, baryon is a, uh, Bound state of n quarks. Okay, so the, the, the mass of the baryon scales as n times lambda qcd. The size of baryon is um, uh, simply lambda qcd. Um, so it's a bound state of quarks. But, but this, there is an alternative description from the uh, ion perspective, and from ion perspective, uh, the, the the baryon is a skirmion. Okay. Okay, so we can think of baryon as as, as uh, composite of uh, quarks, or we can think of it as a skirmion and solid on a pion, right? Of pions. Okay. Um, now, um, of course, these two descriptions match. That, that, that's the whole point of Witten, and uh, in general, we know that this is the case. So again, okay, so now, uh, now the question is, what is the entropy of a baryon? All right, and what is the maximum entropy the baryon can have? Now, the entropy of the baryon is the, of course, it's as usual entropy. Uh, so, of course, here entropy is defined as log from number of the, the generic microstates. Okay, and for baryon, those come from the represent because baryon forms a representation of the flavor group. Okay, so correspondingly, it's simply a dimensional log out of dimensionality of the representation. Of the flavor group that baryon transforms, and the question is how large, how far we can push this this representation. And there is a beautiful thing that theory prevents us from pushing it farther than n. So maximal entropy is n because to push it farther, it would require a number of. So basically, the entropy is extremized when, for any given number uh, n, is extremized with number of. Uh, uh, colors and number of flavors are of the same order. But if we try to push it farther, theory stops to be asymptotically free. And so this is a beautiful example how theory prevents us from endowing uh, the baryon with the large with the higher entropy. Okay. Now, sure. Okay. Now we have this form. Um, so this sort of immediately uh, we can think in, the, in the, those terms that the maximum entropy is equal to the a uh, number of uh, constituents of the baryon, but there is immediately we can realize that there are also all three, and of course Degenstein reproduced by this um, uh, by this story. Because first, notice the following thing that um, uh, n, right? So just just to be clear, this, this number is log roughly of uh, nf two n c or something like that. Exactly. Yeah. It's a, it's a, yeah. Absolutely. But, but when, when NF is some multiple of NC, yeah, that number is it's it's absolutely, absolutely, absolutely correct. So it's NF over NC to the N. Yeah, right. Absolutely correct. That number yeah. Absolutely correct. Mm -hmm. So now the uh, notice the following that also simultaneously. So therefore, if we take this uh, on the verge of saturating the asymptotic freedom, the baryon the, of the maximal entropy, maximal entropy baryon has this entropy, which is also. Maximum entropy, which is also is given precisely by Bekenstein, because notice that n is nothing but n baryon times r baryon. So this is also n baryon times r baryon. Okay, 
And of course, this is also because of total limits and because at the baryon scale, the top coupling is one. This is also one over alpha. <laughs> so you, you're doing this collective coordinate quantization of spermion based. Yeah, for example. Uh, counting what is the dimension of the exactly, absolutely very good. So cluster presentation. Right. So this is uh, yeah, this is going to be the long distance way. This is the long, long distance way. Absolutely. Thanks very much for, for, for commenting. I wanted to comment on that because from the long distance perspective, but precisely. The degeneracy of the scale we can derive from the collective core. Like, yeah, like the analog of our types. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the way you can think, so in a sense, a, a long distance observer can think of a skirmion because skirmion is a state with high occupation number of pions. Interior of the skirmion spontaneously breaks flavor symmetry farther. Okay, so it's not just you and so this you can understand in, in collective coordinates and. That of course that fully agrees with this with this much. As a historical remark for NF equals three, this was worked out exactly 40 years ago. About 40 years ago. 40 years, yeah. Everyone was more. Ah, 40. Well, the, the okay. collective coordinate for SU3 multiple. Ah, okay, okay. So yeah, very good. Okay. This was the topic, everyone. There was no string yet. So. <laughs> okay, very good. No, sure. No, no, yes, as, as I said, I mean, this, these, are, these, are, these are known things that I'm just fishing them out. I think everyone was doing just an F equal two and an F equal three people. I don't remember people talking about this INF limit. But I haven't done my question though. Yeah. So for example, so we can, we can, uh, uh, we can do a sort of microscopic estimate that would give you NF2 to MC, something like that. Yes. And then we can do the macroscopic one, yeah. it doesn't see MC at all. Right. No, it does see it from the Wesemino term. Ah, okay. Well, even okay. even even simpler. So the the way and C enters in the. But I mean, it's not entering as a count. Okay, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, right. yeah I don't see how the formula NF choose NC is going to come out of that. Does right. From the macroscopic point of view, yeah. from the macroscopic description, what enters is the following thing. It's a, sorry, not macroscopic. Macroscopic. Right. Macroscopic. Similarly, the degrees of freedom are pions. They, they have this decay constants, etc. And so you can form, of course, alpha pion, right? An alpha pion at the momentum transfer of baryonic, of, of size of the baryon, that is precisely one over n, okay? This is the way the theory of uh, ion knows about number of colors. And so correspondingly now, if I form a soliton out of ion and do this, this precisely gives me exactly the same count as from microscopic theory, as it should, of course. I mean, I know that the N is there in the effective theory. I don't see how- this. No, it's an excellent yeah. question. Absolutely. Thanks. Yeah, that, that was actually exactly 40 years ago that uh, Ed wrote a paper about the ways of the term having coefficient and C. And, and then you work out the collective coordinate wave functions. Yeah, and so farther constraint coming from it, this. Sure, sure. Term. So the farther, of course, the Vesumino term, et cetera, this is, uh, these are these accompanying the story. But the, what I'm saying is that the way uh, the information about NC penetrates, the, the theory of pion is, is through alpha alpha mm -hmm. pion. And correspondingly, I can do counting of the flavor story through this. I think what, I, what I'm getting at is that uh, mm -hmm. from, the, from the microscopic count, uh, you, if we try to make it a little bit more precise, it's not just n; it's something like n log n f over n. There's some uh, extra factor like that. Uh, oh, you mean some log n for n? Yeah, just because you know it's roughly n f choose n c, something like that. Yeah, they are logarithmic. Yeah, I can give yeah. you the. Exactly. But, but where, where is that log? And I mean that, but that. Yeah, but. We're, 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 where does that? Well, you should get the right representation, right? So when you do the collective coordinate, right. 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 Yeah, right. 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 Yeah, of course. Yeah, right. Yeah, I see. That's right. Right. It's the thing that makes them uh, fermions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, it's the easiest for others because for you and then see there will be both. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So absolutely. So now the okay. So the the point is this, and now interesting thing is the area law because the area law. Uh, because you can see that this same thing of baryon, max entropy, is essentially the area in the units of ion decay constant. As you can see very easily. Why? Because the area, area is lambda minus two, and ion decay, but ion coupling is one over n lambda square. Okay. 
sorry, one over n, one over lambda square. Okay, and correspondingly, this is simply n. So, therefore, we recover not only Wittgenstein, which was sort of a starting point to, to look for, but we recover the area law very similar to, to a black hole area law. And the story continues, this story holds for arbitrary, at least all the objects that I know that are saturated objects, always there is also an area law uh, given in this, uh, in this form. Okay. It's okay. Perfect to four dimensions. Or? No, actually, it's arbitrary dimensions. Even in for this, uh, yeah, all these all these expressions, all these things are in arbitrary number dimension. So, if you have a theory in which you find such a saturated state, that the, these relations they emerge as automatic relations. For example, there is a beautiful example. Uh, a collaborator of mine, Otto Satellafili, and, and me, we wrote a paper in uh, in gross Nivier theory. Okay. Uh, which is one plus one dimensional theory. And actually, in gross TV, there are these uh, there are these uh, bound states, fermion bound states, and uh, the, the there is a saturated bound state, which again obeys all these conditions for corresponding number of dimensions. So, so this is universal because in any dimension area is well defined, and, and G uh, G of uh, the Goldstone is also well defined. Okay. Now let me so therefore let me now don't give you more examples. I mean there are more examples. By now we studied many, and they are essentially what is interesting is that somehow these saturated states they sort of imitate black holes in corresponding theories because they have also other properties. For example, the relation between the maximal spin and entropy is the same as for a black hole. Um, the um, when they decay, they decay in a thermal-like way at the beginning of, of the decay. And the time scale for information retrieval, because you see, for example, in, in, in baryons, you can store quantum information in the flavor quantum numbers of baryons. And the time scale of that information retrieval, okay, is again very similar to pages time, okay? What for what is for, for a black hole? So the time scale scales as entropy, time and size. It's always repeats itself over and over again and okay so then you can write these several forms because since the entropy is one over alpha you can say it's one over alpha r and so on so okay so now let me move to the one of the implications potential implications that these objects may have um in for cosmology okay um and uh, uh, something that uh, puts their them, them, them at certain Interesting advantage. Yeah, it just asks, so yeah. what happens if you like keep an f equal three, say, and make n c large? Ah, no, then baryon is way undersaturated. Mm -hmm. Then it's undersaturated, then there is nothing interesting from Bekenstein's point of view, of course, or any, any other entropy point of view. And say my, my earlier uh, question a little more. So, from, so, 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 so clearly, the, the fact that you have the same Baryon representations has got to be seen on both sides. Absolutely, so absolutely. Right. Counting is the same. But microscopically, you have this limit on NF that you don't see macroscopic. Uh, no, you see, you see, you see it from the action. That's an excellent point, actually. Yeah. Uh, I, because you see it because the the top coupling for pions depends on NF, right? Because the pions form a representation of the. No, but I, I mean it. The, the, the microscopic limit on MF has to do with 11 thirds. I mean, there's some specific number that has to do with the beta function. Et no, no. I, I, How does that number show up in the, in the, I mean, order, yeah, up to order one factor. That I yeah, I mean, but there's something sort of. Oh, you, you, are, you are asking about the precise number. Yeah, I guess. I know, precise yeah. number, because one has to work out. Yeah, here, as I told but you. I don't see how numbers are. Yeah, on the finer level, there can also be conformal window, right? Yes, right. So, exactly. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Exactly. 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 Where, exactly. So this right. is one of the things that we are trying to think about: what happens in the conformal window, what with these type of things, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yes, of course. It's an interesting point. But just to answer, sort of a, a milder version of your of your question is that the the what happens is that for ions, there is a so for ions there is a, uh, a lambda of pion. Right, and lambda of pion actually is uh, alpha of pion times nf, and then the way pion controls this this uh, the uh, the 
the bound that the, you cannot make an F too large is because otherwise uh, the torque coupling for pion would become too large at that scale. Okay. So, so yeah, there's a machine, but absolutely, <laughs> as far as the size coefficient is concerned, of course, that, that's, that requires to be worked out. Yeah, sure. And um, okay, so let me now. Uh, what did I do here? Uh, this makes the noise, right? Yeah. So now let me go to move to cost. I can continue on this blackboard or erase that. I don't know what. I think it's good to keep the formulas just in case. It, so cosmology, right? Dark matter. Now in cosmology, okay, we have this uh, fantastic thing uh, about dark matter. This is one of the indications of the physics beyond the standard model. Uh, and uh, so we don't know what it is. And there are some very interesting candidates for for the, for for, for, for the dark matter, but we don't really know what it is. And um, okay, there are uh, candidates that we can split in two classes. Okay, so one the first category is particle dark matter. Okay, so. Now, particle dark matter, um, uh, the pro property of particle dark matter is that it can be produced by quantum scattering of a thermal bus, for example, okay? So in other words, if you have a, a particle of mass M and you get a thermal bus at uh, temperature larger of order M, through the rescattering, or even if the, a particle in question is initially not in thermal equilibrium with the thermal bus, the constituents of the thermal bath can rescatter and produce a particle. Okay, so dark matter particle. So dark matter particle can be produced thermally, okay, as long as temperature is larger than the mass of a dark matter particle. Okay. On the other hand, if mass is much larger than the temperature, okay, so there is a lim this puts limitation of the production of dark matter uh, dark particle dark matter because if mass is much larger than temperature, then we have Boltzmann separation. Then there is an exponent exponent minus m over t. And so particles are not, cannot be really produced at uh, the uh, temperatures much higher than the, their mass. Another category of dark matter is macroscopic dark matter, okay? Macroscopic, macroscopic dark matter, for example, could be black holes or black holes. Solitons. Okay, so in other words, objects that are not particles, but they are sort of collections of many particles, or they are classical objects or macroscopical. Now, here too, we have uh, 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 the same story uh, that uh, they, these, these objects cannot be produced um, at temperatures uh, less than their mass, okay, thermally, by thermal quantum uh, scattering, cannot be produced. Uh, actually, the separation is even stronger because even if temperature, even if you have a temperature comparable to the mass of a, uh, you cannot have temperature comparable to the mass of a black hole because then you need Transplanckian temperature. But if you have a temperature, let's say above a mass of a magnetic monopole or a soliton, still the production is exponentially suppressed okay? because of the multi-particle nature. So these are indirect quantum scatterings these objects are not produced. They do always exponential separation, and which I will come back to this. But I mean, cosmologically, you also have like the cubic mechanism. Yeah, that's what I said. Like these objects, and it's yeah. not exponential separation. Yeah, yeah, but because, but because that's not really the quantum scattering. That's a collective effect. So that's why, absolutely, yeah. So they, that's why you can certainly produce solitons. This is what I'll say next. But this requires phase transitions. So you require some kind of phase transition or cable mechanisms. So you, you, you require a multi-particle process, a process in which not just two particles scattering or, or, or simply a homogeneous thermal bath, but some phase transition. No, of course, I mean, <laughs> black holes and solitons are very exciting dark matter candidates, obviously. Uh, the, 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 the main issue with the black hole, primordial black holes and dark matter are still are production mechanisms. Okay, so we, uh, it's, really, it's really high and non-trivial to really honestly produce them in a consistent quantum field theory without either putting strong coupling somewhere and this kind of stuff. But of course, these are extremely interesting candidates. 
Let people say that you can produce them enhancing the fluctuations. The yes, right. Yes, but even then it's not so straightforward. So you need to really play around. I mean, uh, no, I mean, there are mechanisms, even uh, my collaborators and I, uh, we pro pro propose some mechanisms, uh, for example, like uh, confined quarks, and when they scatter, they can produce things, or magnetic monopoles uh, confined by strings. Uh, Alex Vilenki had some uh, collision with bu of bubbles and this kind of so stuff. I'm not saying that they cannot be produced, of course. I mean, they are still valid. Dark matter candidates are very interesting. But but there is one advantage that these uh, saturon type states can carry over ordinary solitons. They can be produced, in principle, they can be produced unsuppressed directly from a, from a thermal bar by quantum scattering. Okay, and let's try to understand this, this point, which is. And in order to understand that, let's, let's first understand why the production of solitons is suppressed. Okay. Uh, now, the uh, probably first example uh, with, is a good, good, good example of the solitonic state suppression of the production of solitonic state in thermal bath, the temperature T, is um, production of vacuum bubbles, okay, which also you can view as, um, as solitons. Um, so the the earliest paper, I think, is by Andrei Linde. Okay, there are okay, many other analysis, but okay, we can just focus on this. So, um, so suppose you have the following situation, right? So you have uh, you have um, potential a, a scalar field, theory of a scalar field with uh, free energy, which has uh, which at some point has the general it has, has a false vacuum and then uh, thermally, okay? So thermally has a it's, it's false vacuum and then there is a lower minimum uh, materialized thermally. Now, what is important here, of course, there is a, this uh, standard analysis, an analysis by Coleman and others at zero temperature. But here we are at high temperature. In particular, temperature effects are important when the, uh, the size of the bubble uh, size of the bubble uh, is larger than the one over t. Okay, because if size of the bubble is much less than one over t, effectively you can apply flat. Uh, sorry, no, zero temperature considerations. Okay, so the, this this is the regime that I will take as a as a as a, as a focus. Okay, so in this regime, what happens is that you have a tunneling from uh, the, the false vacuum, but it's thermal tunneling from false vacuum to, to whatever, the local minimum, and you produce a, a bubble, okay? Now the bubble has certain uh, uh, critical size, et cetera, et cetera, and the end result here, uh, this is, uh, these are pretty standard things, but the important thing here is that the rate is suppressed exponentially by an expression, and I, I will change my patients, usually people call it S3, but I'll call it A3, uh, so A3 is, is um, now you know that uh, high temperature field theory can treat it as a compactified theory with compactified Euclidean time, okay? And so A3 is an Euclidean action of, a, uh, of an Euclidean bounce, bounce uh, basically a critical bubble, okay? Um, which essentially agrees with the energy of a real bubble viewed in, in, in as a solution in Minkowski uh, 3 plus 1, okay? So, so effectively, A3 is an energy of a bubble, critical bubble. Okay. Okay, so that we have this suppression. Oh, there is a pre-factor which is not so important for this. Now, in order to understand why, uh, if I have a saturated bubble, not so not a bubble or any sort of, okay, uh, with what the signs are, why this suppression is uh, overcompensated. Okay, uh, can be under understood if we first reinterpret this suppression in the entropy language, which is sort of interesting on its own. Okay, so let me reinterpret this suppression, this result in the language of entropy. Okay, so um, so what is the situation? We we have a thermal bath and now in this thermal bath, so we are here, of course. We have thermal bath, 
And in this thermal bath, we are looking for a solid onto material bath, right? Okay, so solid on acceptance size R. Okay, so now size R because I'm looking for a solid on which is, which is optimal. Of course, larger ones are suppressed. So, so there is some optimal solid on which in this formula is this, this described as a, as, a, as a bubble, as a critical bubble, okay? And of this radius R, so this solid one. Okay, so now let's try to understand what are the conditions that have to be satisfied, okay? Now, there are two conditions. So the, first of all, there is one condition of energy conservation, right? That um, the, the energy of the sphere, of radiation sphere, right? So energy of radiation sphere, uh, everybody can see this, right? The, the energy of radiation sphere is, so we have thermal bath with certain number of species in thermal equilibrium. These species are not necessarily specified, okay? Could be standard model, could be whatever. So the energy of the radiation within the sphere goes as uh, T to the fourth, number of species, R cube, okay? And now what is required is that the, and at the same time, there is entropy of radiation, right? The entropy of radiation goes as number of species, T cube R cube. Okay, so notice that entropy of radiation essentially goes as the energy of radiation times, sorry, divided by, no, this is the, the, the channel. Okay, fine. Now, in order to, for, the, for, a, for a bubble to materialize, for a soliton to materialize, right, the energy of uh, this radiation bubble should be equal to the energy of the soliton. Okay, so this gives a condition. E radiation is equal to the E solid bath. Okay? Fine. This you, we can satisfy. But now, if soliton, so, so now you satisfy this condition, okay? But if soliton carries, usually soliton carries the, in very little entropy, almost zero. Why? Because soliton is a coherent state with no very little degeneracy. And so there is no entropy. So now what happens is that you need to convert quantum mechanically a high entropy state into much lower entropy state. This, of course, requires price of entropy separation. So we could immediately make a guess that there must be exponent minus the entropy of this radiation, separation by the entropy of this radiation. I mean, minus the entropy of the soliton, but the entropy of the soliton is very little. So, but now take this into account and you get exactly Linda's formula. Uh, so, sorry, this is uh, radiation. So, you get the, the radiation, but this is also energy of the solid form. So, you get the size of the solid form. So, we, you get, we get exactly this, okay? So, in this way, there is a simple entropic way to understand this exponential suppression of a uh, for thermal formation of a critical bubble when there is no entropy. Of course, in those examples that Linda considered, that these bubbles were not saturated bubbles. They had not essentially zero entropy. Okay, so now we are ready to see how the story will change if the if we have a saturation. Uh, let me yeah, let me use actually I can use this. Uh, your thing also. Razor, right? You have to use Let's see if I, if I learn how to do it. The other way, the other way. Other way, sorry. Like that? Ah, okay, fantastic. Go speak otherwise. Okay, okay, great. Well, you see, I made a mistake. Okay, so yeah, okay, I can essentially erase this part. You know, don't need. Okay, so now suppose the same thing happens, okay? The same process, but now instead of an ordinary soliton, I have a saturon, okay? Well, uh, the energy of the entropy of a saturon is, as we know, right? From, because it's, it's, it's Bekenstein, right? And so entropy of the saturon is E 
times the, the radius, okay? This are uh, okay. And uh, uh, so here we, so correspondingly, of course, you will still get this, uh, the, the separation factor by the entropy of radiation. But now this gets multiplied by the entropy of the saturation. okay? So now notice the following, that the entropy of the energy of saturon is entropy of radiation times temperature, right? So therefore, energy of saturon is entropy of saturon uh, of radiation times, times temperature. So we got this factor, T times R, right? And uh, so the, since R is much larger than one over T, T times R is a large number, okay? Correspondingly, this number is much larger than the, the, the entropy of radiation. Correspondingly, the, now the rate goes as, of course, exponent minus the E of, a, of, a, of a, I mean, entropy minus S radiation, right? But it's multiplied by the saturon, and the end result is exponent minus one minus ER S radiation. So of course, ER is number much larger than one, okay? So, so the, the, the suppression is compensated. Of course, uh, this should not leave a wrong impression that you can make uh, the transition rate arbitrarily large because, of course, at the end of the day, the figure is actually a unitarity. Uh, so what will happen is that the optimal temperature will, will be, once the universe goes down, you have optimal temperature. At that temperature, you start producing those saturons, okay? So where the, so essentially, the, the optimal, there's a, there's a window of opportunity for producing uh, saturons when the universe cools down, okay? Yeah. Ah, yeah, plus, sorry. Yes, of course. Plus. Yeah, because that's the microstate degeneracy. Yeah, essentially this illustrates the point. So now, of course, we can play around with this, um, um, yeah, we can play around with this, uh, with this, uh, uh, yeah. Different different types of entropies, different types of you know sizes of saturons, etc., etc. Et now, um, so the following question, right? So, so this should not leave an impression that the saturons are overabundant. Why? Because the following happens uh, in the when the universe cools down. At some point, there is an optimal temperature. So there is an optimal temperature. Uh, which is given by this condition that the saturon energy in your QCD example, this is at the QCD scale, right? It's, it's when uh, the water... Right. So QCD example is very interesting because uh, in QCD, in real QCD, you mean, right? No, I mean, ah, right. they are, yeah, yeah, they are okay. Okay. Right, right. Of course. So, so you're, so you say that even though the temperatures of order lambda QCD, right, are unsuppressed, making. Uh, the baryons when NF is the order MC, right? Unsuppressed makes right. a baryon, even though the baryons right. are n times heavier. Right. Baryons. Okay. I mean, I would be a little bit careful in the following sense that this discussion is order of magnitude wise, of course, because as I said, all the coefficients I said. No, but there's no e to the minus n. Exactly. No, no. Yeah, exactly. So the n scalings are, are are absolute. That's the point. It's all about large n scaling, of course. Now, obviously, uh, in any particular model of dark matter. This should be worked out carefully, and all the all the coefficients, etc. Absolutely. Uh, I, I come back to QCD once I conclude. I, I think I'm almost done, and I, I think also time time is up. But um, yeah, what I want to say is this uh, dilution factor, because what happens is this, right? So when the temperature when the temperature decreases, at some point there is an optimal window for the transition, but. Uh, of course, the transition is not instantaneous, right? And the best way to understand the transition is not instantaneous is to think of saturon as a, a saturon production as a multi-particle process, okay? So in other words, you have uh, a thermal bath, and this goes into a, a saturon state, right? Now, 
the occupation, so the number of quanta in saturon that compose saturon is proportional to the temperature, okay? And correspondingly, the number of quanta that, propose, that compose the radiation sphere of the same energy is much less than the composition of the saturon, okay? So in other words, the process and radiation is much less than n saturon. Correspondingly, okay, this process is a transition process of uh, few into many. And normally it would be exponentially suppressed, but then it's compensated by the, uh, so which is, which is equal to entropy. So normally this process, uh, few, I mean, few to many, it doesn't matter what this, this few is, this many is always suppressed exponent minus many, okay? And so this is another way to see why for ordinary solid on this would be suppressed, but, but for such on this compensated. However, the transition time is given, is given by, so it's not instantaneous. The transition time, a key transition of this quantum process is given by the characteristic wavelength of saturon quanta because that's the momentum transfer in this multi-particle scattering process. So this is given by R. But the universe doesn't wait. It expands, right? So the temperature changes. And then this, this gives additional suppression. And there is a suppression factor, dilution factor, which goes like one over, of course, it's suppressed with the transition. There is a bubble uh, entering in the rate and uh, something like that. Yeah, something one over S. This is the factor. So if there is this factor that, okay, I call it B. There is a factor that suppresses the, the, the probability because the universe expands. And if it expands too fast, the, if, if the, the opportunity window can be missed. But it, it, it's a good thing because normally you don't need to overproduce saturants because otherwise you would, you would, you know, it's the usual story, you will get the problem. So whenever we overproduce dark matter, we, it's not, no longer dark matter, it's a problem, right? So, so, so this is one, one, uh, built-in mechanism of the suppression of the saturon abundance. This is so model, model independent. Of course, there can be model dependent mechanisms. Uh, obviously, for example, you can have a theory in which you have a solid one which is well, which is not exactly a saturon but close to it, and you know this kind of things. Okay, I'm not going to enter in, in this discussion. So, in conclusion, let me just mention the following interesting fact about real QCD. Now, in real QCD, uh, there is this uh, state, so-called color glass condensate, okay? This is, I mean, this has been discussed a long time by McLaren, Manugopalan, and uh, people, other people. Okay, so there is this uh, state, and then relatively recently, Raju and I, we, we argued that actually this satisfies all the properties of being a saturated state. So the bubble of a, uh, of a uh, colored glass condensate, uh, yeah, essentially is a saturon. It behaves like a, okay, behaves like a saturon. So is this the same as a quark-gluon plasma? Or is it... uh, no, that's a spe specific state, which was, uh, this is a long story, I mean, okay. so I think it showed up in Daisy, long ago in DAISY data somehow, that there is some kind of a, uh, it's not a plasma, it's a, they call it condensate. I mean, condensate is not, some people I think criticize this thing because it's not the Bose-Einstein condensate. It's, it's condensate in the sense that it's a high occupation number of gluons of a particular uh, momentum, they call it QS, saturated momentum, okay? But it's called condensate just because of this. So it's not a plasma, it's like opposite to plasma. It's, it's, a, it's a, and precisely the, the point here is that it looks, the reason why it is formed is precisely because it has so high entropy that it saturates unitarity. And that's why it's a preferred state in the collision, okay? For example, I don't know, in heavy ion or whatever. Uh, yeah, now, obviously, if, if this is the case, uh, if, if, if our arguments are correct, then, this is a very interesting uh, candidate for early universe. Uh, okay, it may contribute something into the QCD dynamics of the early universe. Of course, it cannot be dark matter because then they, 
in ordinary QCD, this color glass is obviously the case. Because QCD becomes confining, but but in the, at the intermediate state, it can play some interesting role. And so, so therefore, somehow this also indicates that the saturants are not that exotic. Maybe they are even in ordinary QCD, they can be they can be present. So um, yeah, basically that's it. <laughs> so, yeah. So there's kind of a microscopic uh, picture you would think for the e to the minus n for the uh, QCD case. It's just imagine you're right around lambda QCD, let's say a little above lambda QCD. You have uh, still unconfined quarks. Yes. But you know, you have kind of uh, the mean, the, the distance is one over lambda QCD, everything is lambda QCD. But then to make baryons, you need to have some over density of NC quarks here, right? Right. NC bar quarks here exactly. and so on. Right. It seems very unlikely to get over densities of NC quarks. Right. So and what, that seems exponentially unlikely. Now, yeah. So what is undoing that exponential in this? Uh, right, right. So, so what, so you're going to label. Uh, yeah, okay. so we have an end. It's the same, yeah, same story. So now, however, this the, the answer is not uh, unfortunately the answer is not so cheap because as again, uh, the, you see the point is okay. So th there is one point which is very clear, right? So what? No, but but but, but I understand the the, the point, but I'm worried about the the, I know, the, I know. the color and anti color. There are I a lot of flavors. To, no, yeah, you I have to worry. Yeah. Yeah. Explain yeah. 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 oh, why? Right. So what I'm saying is going. So the. Uh, the the when if, when if you construct a state a state which is baryon and anti baryon on top of each other, right. okay. So let's construct that state has more entropy than baryon alone, okay. Despite the fact that it's now the flavor, okay. So now the point is that uh, so the, the point is the question is we, so so of course if that state is a saturon then it's produced and suppressed because as, as, as one said because this automatically means that the flavor degeneracy is the right one which essentially is, is very close from saturating the unitarity okay uh, now so therefore here of course we are in the game how close we are to this saturation point okay so whether uh, you know, saturate the way the baryon anti baryon is really close to saturation, uh, or it's, 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 it's a way by whatever factor which would make significantly exponential suppression. If it is a saturated state, of course, simple counting. Uh, show, because you see, it's very simple. You have a, let's say, thermal uh, sphere, and you're saying, I have at, at the end of the day, Wittgenstein, but let's take Wittgenstein bomb, right? Wittgenstein bomb tells me, okay, if you have this thermal sphere, Right uh, or any other sphere, the number of states in the Hilbert space is limited by this. You simply cannot have more states. Period. Now, if if someone comes and tells you, okay, I have this state, which which essentially saturates all those states which are available, has the same number, then you understand that okay, they, they cannot be anything else. You have to move there, okay, to this saturated state. Okay, but the question, of course, is to really have a clean saturated state. To to, uh, to be sure that the flavors are such that you know they really saturate the the bomb. But as as if I was uh, saying, if an F is three and I give an C large, of course the state is undersaturated. It's not gonna form it. What you're saying related to this color flavor locking? Like that's a good question. Yes, that's a good question. Maybe maybe somehow it is it is related. Somehow I, it was on the back of my mind somehow to look up in, into that story closer. I didn't manage, but it, it, it could be related. Yes, yes, yeah. You see, in this business, sort of, you see, obviously, large MQCD is pretty well understood. Okay, relatively well understood. And they are very difficult to rediscover new things there. It's just mostly here looking from a new perspective. Okay, on things, and then because of this saturation, using it for cosmology. Because, of course, <laughs> large QCD was not really discussed too much in the cosmological context, and so, or, or any other large gen theory. So, so the main, main thing here is to sort of try to have a very different look at the known things. Okay. okay. <laughs> Any other questions for Gia? By the way, before, sorry, 
This thing about, uh, so for, example, for example, we are not true. We still are trying to understand what is the real uh, evolution story with baryon and dibaryon on top of each other. This is great. It's an extremely interesting question. I will not enter into technical, technical details, but yeah, it's really, it's really um, very interesting how, how this state even tries to decay because in large gen actually it looks like it is, <laughs> it is eternal. Uh, so, it's, and uh, okay, so th therefore, yeah. Okay, all right, I'll flat, let's start again.